Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Mission Control, a podcast focusing on executive directors and nonprofit leaders and how they strive to make positive impact in their community. I'm your host, Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Introduce Multimedia, and I'd like to welcome from Michigan Virtual, Scott Watkins. How are you doing, Scott? Hey, you doing great, Paul. Thank you so much for having me. All right. So how I always start each one of these, because the title of the show is Mission Control. What is the mission of Michigan Virtual? Yeah, the the mission of Michigan Virtual is to help provide every learner an opportunity to use online and digital learning opportunities to reach their maximum potential. Great. So tell me now, I know that you're not necessarily or you're not the executive director, but what is your position or as my favorite quote from office space, what exactly would you say you do here? Right. Yeah, that is an awesome quote. And it's a little different every day, actually. Um, I'm a senior director for business strategy. So I spend a lot of time thinking about and looking at new and next and positioning the organization, hopefully to be just as relevant in about 25 years as we are today, because we're in our 25th year of existence as an organization focused on online and digital learning going back to 1998. So truly pioneers in the online learning space and uh, pretty relevant today. And we hope to maintain that over the next 25 years at a minimum. How long have you been in this role? Yeah, I've been with Michigan Virtual for going on six years now. Six years, but you say that they've been around for 25. Yeah, the organization, um, like I said, truly, truly a pioneer for online learning, going back to dial up and yelling at somebody to hang up the phone because you're trying to get connected and everything else. So, Holy cow. Uh, that is pioneering. Um, <clears throat> did it always start out as Michigan Virtual or was it something that ended up being called Michigan Virtual. Yeah, no, it's always started. It's been Michigan Virtual. Uh, our our legal name or our original name was Michigan Virtual University. And for the first year or two, we had more of a jobs training and a workforce development focus. Um, late 90s, focus on the auto sector and re retraining a lot of that skilled labor. Um, but that only lasted for a year or two and it, it quickly shifted to focus on the K-12 space um, and Michigan became the first state in the nation even to have an online learning requirement for graduation um, back in 2000, 2001 under Governor Engler at that time. And that's uh, really the, the mission that he kind of assigned and set up Michigan Virtual to pursue as an independent nonprofit. We're a 501c3, and uh, it's really what we've been doing for 25 years now. I mean... I, I, right now, that's boggling my mind. I know that I was I was looking up your background. I guess I didn't look up much into Michigan Virtual because I just figured it was. I've heard about Michigan Virtual and I knew about it for several years. I didn't realize the complete age of the organization. I mean, um, how did you how did you hear about them? How did you end up in this in this role? Yeah, well, you know, education has always been something I've greatly valued. I uh, started my career in consulting and economic policy and market analysis uh, with a boutique consulting firm called Anderson Economic Group. Um, and then I transitioned into doing some entrepreneurial work on my own, some consulting and a, a small startup. Um, and I saw the opportunity with Michigan Virtual for a strategy position. And I was actually brought on to help um, craft a strategic plan originally, which uh, I, I guess that worked out pretty well because here I still am some six years later. Um, but yeah, it, it started as a, a consulting opportunity and turned into a full-fledged role with the organization shortly thereafter. Well, um, let's let's actually go backwards a little bit, back into your past. I mean, you have a huge uh, history with like, like you mentioned, some strategic developments um, market analysis, analytics in and of itself. What is it about about the research and analytics side that really 
speak to you? I love solving problems and I love pursuing opportunities, whether they're opportunities or problems that I face or probably more likely opportunities and challenges or problems that others face. Um, so that problem solving and that figuring out how to capitalize on an opportunity is something that um, just kind of fills my bucket. It, it's what I enjoy doing, again, whether it's for myself or for somebody else or for an organization. Um, I'm not sure when I figured that out. A lot of times people ask like, oh, when did you know what you wanted to do? And uh, to be forthright, I, I love to say I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. Um, I'm pretty sure I don't want to grow up, but uh, <laughs> but a lot of that comes down to I like to pursue opportunities as they come up and I like to create opportunities. Um, and I, I'm really fortunate to be able to do a lot of that in my role with Michigan Virtual. Now, um, you know, looking at some of the stuff that you've done, you, you also helped develop uh, a business called what was it ad luminate is that yeah right? yep it was a, a startup idea i had had for a while kind of a two-sided marketplace in the advertising space um and I, I i learned a ton from doing that and never really took off i, I learned i kind of bit off more than i could chew and a lot of innovation has to be iterative and i was trying to boil an ocean um but uh yeah it, it was worth doing just for that learning opportunity so what was the main thing that you learned from that experiment? Yeah, really it's um, iterate and do small things to test market and find product market fit. Um, not just so that you're sure that you're meeting actual customer needs, but so that you can provide yourself the runway and the set of small wins along the way to get to the final destination. Um, I was I was trying to build the final destination up front, even though I knew I shouldn't, even though I, I had consulted and told others not to do that. Um, I, I didn't listen to myself, I guess. Uh, maybe I thought that I was, I knew better, maybe a little bit of Hubert, but uh, a, a great learning opportunity by and large. Met a lot of great people through that process, learned a lot. Um, and it, it helped me discover um, kind of the joy that comes from creating opportunities, solving problems, and working towards that. Well, what made you want to step out into that realm? I mean, what you, you just said <laughs> that you advised other folks not to maybe do something like that. What was it that you saw that you're like, well, you know what? There, there, this is a problem that needs to be solved. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I advise people not to, not to boil the ocean and go – <laughs> Go for the big problem. I, I would absolutely advise anybody who sees a problem or an opportunity to go out and try to solve that. Take the leap, be innovative, be entrepreneurial, 100%. Go and do that. Um, but yeah, it, it was a just kind of a, a problem that probably for the better part of five, six, seven years, I had kind of thought about and had the idea of uh, and finally got to a point where I said, you know, it, it's kind of now or never, I got to give this a try. Um, and a lot of it was, yeah, just knowing that I would have regrets if I didn't try. And uh, I tried, I failed, and I have no regrets. Yeah, I think that that's, that right there, I mean, it takes a lot of guts to do that. But then also the rewards, whether you succeed or not, you, you gather so much from um, yep. so is there pieces, I know we talked about what you learned, but is there pieces that you developed, um, within that ecosystem, whether it's software or, or, uh, you know, processes or anything like that, that you actually use, um, on a regular basis today, kind of like what Steve Jobs did when he, you know, when he left Pixar or not Pixar, but, um, was it next? use the next right. yeah. platform to move into move back into Apple and incorporated that in it. Is there stuff that you like kind of like cannibalized? Nothing tangible, no, no physical or digital assets, but certainly in terms of knowledge and awareness, um, just being introduced to lean startup methodology, uh, business modeling, and then just getting connected to the entrepreneurial and the innovative ecosystem in and across Michigan 
um, I had the opportunity to, to present it, uh, the idea of what was uh, the Michigan Growth, or is still the Michigan Growth Capital Symposium, the green light pitch competition that uh, used to be held at Michigan State and beyond. Um, so just having those opportunities, literally and figuratively being on the stage, pitching an idea, refining it, um, trying to sell it, trying to hone in on um, product market fit and solving for the needs and the problems that customers face, uh, really invaluable lessons that I, I take and put to work every day. And so now fast forwarding to today, um, you know, joining Michigan Virtual, what are some of the areas um, over the 25 year span? You, you've only been there for, you know, the six years, uh, but what are some of the areas prior to the pandemic? We'll get to that in a second because I know that that had a huge impact. But what are the areas that you really focused on aside from K through 12 or is it just really K through 12? Uh, and within the organization's history, they've, they've focused a little on workforce development. They've tried some GED stuff. Um, but our primary focus over the, the entire year is we say K-12 really on the student side, it's been at the high school level and a little bit at the middle school level for student courses. Uh, where K-12 comes in is we do a lot of professional learning too. So online courses that educators, school personnel, school board members, administrators, mm. uh, others can take for their either professional development requirements to keep their certificate in place or um, for compliance purposes, courses like bloodborne pathogens and first aid and things along those lines, or simply to become uh, better masters of their craft. That's awesome. What kind of, uh, when you first started um, with uh, Michigan Virtual, did you start where you are now or did you have to move up? Uh, where exactly were you and what did you, what was your focus? Yeah. Um, my position has evolved. It has evolved a little bit over time, but but not too much. Um, I came into to largely the same role with a strategy focus. Um, the original title had more of a business intelligence angle to it, um, but it just kind of as we've renamed things, it became simpler to just do business strategy, a little more encompassing. Um, so it hasn't changed too much. Um, one of the main focuses originally and still is voice of customer and making sure that we're bringing feedback in from our customers, from our users, and we're iterating to make sure that we're meeting those needs um, and creating value for our users and our customers. Um, I just looked at one of our surveys that one of the first ones I implemented some six years ago, we're now at over 200,000 pieces of or individual customer responses to that survey over the six years. Um, mm. And combining that with student and other surveys, we're over probably heard from over a quarter of a million users just in terms of end of course type surveys. Um, so you've taken a course from us, let us know what you think. Quarter of a million responses on that that get acted on. That's what I'm most proud of for that program is the information is actionable. Um, and we look at it regularly and it's used in product development decisions and follow-up is made when customers aren't satisfied. So we're really focusing on customer experience and customer value. So about halfway through your tenure there, there ended up being a global event that kind of like threw everybody in a tailspin. <laughs> How did that global event affect the day-to-day -day working life of what you are already established doing um did it increase did you have to like talk to me about those days i know that um we're three years beyond that however there's still repercussions and still still new things that have uh propped up because of it so how did it affect your world yeah it's funny that from at that point, we were probably 80 to 90% of the way into completing the second strategic plan that I was a part of with Michigan Virtual. And the vision that we were setting forth under that strategic plan 
was to allow every person to use digital learning to reach their full potential, um, similar to the mission I shared earlier. And in the, the snap of a finger, it pretty much became necessary that pretty much everybody was using digital learning. Um, now we can we can talk about whether it was helping them reach their full potential or not. Uh, <laughs> but almost overnight, I think that was March 13th, when things everything started shutting down 2020. The next day or within the next weeks or months, everybody was introduced to digital learning. And I'll say for better or for worse. Um, but it just rapidly introduced everybody to it one way or another. Um, as part of that strategic plan, one of our um, initiatives, even before COVID, we were thinking about enabling flexible learning models for schools across Michigan to allow schools to have more of a digital first component, even in the in-person, what we might now think about as a hybrid environment. Um, so actually late February, 2020, internally, we were running design sprints thinking about how we could do this. And at that point, we were talking about uh, winter 2019, 2020, that winter, a lot of schools had four, five, six, seven, eight snow days and cold days. So learning was being interrupted by cold weather, Michigan weather. We we're saying, you know what, losing a week of school is pretty bad. We weren't anticipating losing entire semesters of school because of COVID. Um, but we were starting to think about that and designing solutions. Uh, and then, yeah, for better or for worse, along comes COVID shutting everything down um, and really going into what we refer to as emergency remote learning for most districts. The pedagogy wasn't there. The, the proper way of using online and digital tools to instruct uh, students most probably 95% weren't familiar with it and it wasn't being done, which led to a lot of very poor introductions to online learning. Um, but it also gave us a, a chance to learn a lot and gave everybody a chance to learn a lot. Um, and we're still trying to process the good from that, what we should continue doing moving forward and uh, the bad, what should, what should we learn from what went wrong too? Well, did you feel like because of your history in this space um, that you felt like you were the go-to resource for a lot of schools and or administration to be like, what do we do? How do we implement this? Um, yeah, it, within, within hours, um, we were taking a lot of our content that may have been behind a paywall and making it available for free. We we're taking a lot of our eight and 14 hour long lessons and just pulling out half hour and hour long pieces that could be immediately applied on the professional learning. Um, it didn't take too long, a matter of months for us to take all of the um, nine through 12, the high school course content that we owned all the intellectual property to and made all the content freely available on our website um, and just setting up tons of opportunities for people to to learn from us as a, a nonprofit to, to support what needed to be done. It was truly kind of an emergency type thing where we said, let's get it out there. We'll, we'll more or less worry about the business or the, the monetary consequences later. It, we have resources, students, need teachers to have these resources, parents need these resources. It, it's the service we have to provide. So yeah, we quickly mobilized to make so much of that available while also trying to handle an influx of um, enrollments into courses, questions about um, how to run things, all of the uncertainty that was going on um, for our customers and also for our staff too. Staff all of a sudden working from home, kids at home, everything else. Um, same thing everybody else in the world faced. Um, we were all fortunate to, to be employed in a, a very in-demand position. Um, so I don't want to say we, we had it bad, but it was challenging times for everybody. Um, but as an organization, we did everything that we could to um, make sure our resources were out there. 
And uh, was it a lot of uh, long days at the beginning there, just uh, trying to trying to pull these pieces out, trying to get every, was it was like all hands on deck and all that stuff. Yeah. Honestly, the, the best description that I can come up with right now is it was a blur. Days, days ran together, hours ran together um, <laughs> for a multitude of things with the work that we had to do with family being home, everything else. Um, it, it was a blur, but boy, as an organization, we were a little bit lucky because we had a, a number of people working fully remote prior to that. Um, so we knew how to do that. It didn't take us time to get a remote workforce set up. Pretty much everybody was able to pick up their laptop, go home, plug in, connect on Zoom, and be incredibly productive. Um, people made a lot of sacrifices, but as an organization, we were very well positioned. So, and also, I mean, with those long hours, long weeks, you know, uh, you know, the, the fight or flight mechanisms kicking in. How did you, how did you and your team really be able to decompress after that? I mean, what did you, how did you handle once, once things started to kind of like even out, what was the, what were some of the things that you guys had to do or just to be like, yeah, we just went through this. How do we process what what this was? Honestly, we might still be in the process of doing that. Um, it, it's been hard to come up for air. Um, a lot of the challenges that anybody has faced because of COVID and because of the change have just kind of continued. We certainly have taken taken time to celebrate the successes to look at the enrollment numbers, to look at the impact we've had on the state, to appreciate some of the recognition that we've had as an organization and kind of our cementing our, our place in terms of being a critical partner to a lot of people in the Michigan education system. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done too. And there's, I think a lot of people in our, our organizations and on our teams even look back and say, oh man, we could have done more, even though there's no way we could have done more. Um, <laughs> we've got a team of incredibly dedicated educators and professionals that um, great is is never even good enough, right? Um, so it's it's hard to take that time to celebrate it, but um, it's, a, it's a great question and probably something we need to, to do a little bit more of, but uh, I know everybody's extremely proud of what we did accomplish. Well, I mean, you know, it seems that a lot of, uh, you know, when you, when you think about the heroes of uh, the pandemic, it really falls on the teachers themselves, the first responders, the, you know, the, um, what do they call the? Yeah, your front you know, line, front the line. Front, yeah, actually. the front line. Yeah, but, you know, some of the, the technology companies almost who are built on virtual um, or have built their whole reputation on that. See, you know, it's like, well, they're they're supposed to be the resource, but no, <laughs> it's yeah. a huge shift. It's a huge shift from the day to day. Yeah, um, and I think we look at it too in terms of there's still recovery to be done for students and for educators. Um, schools are different places in terms of the stresses put on educators during the pandemic and that continue on it to be put on educators. Students um, did face setbacks in terms of their access to learning. Um, I don't like to say there is learning loss. Um, students learned a lot during COVID. It's just not really aligned to what's being tested in state tests. They learned about life. They learned about loss. They learned about grief. They learned about survival. Um, Maybe they didn't learn the algebra that's going to show up on the state test or some of the critical reasoning skills that are going to show up on state tests, um, which is all very important and all things we need to get back to. So even what, yeah, once we come out of COVID, we're focusing on high dosage tutoring and getting access to enrichment programs and other things to catch students up um, and also to relieve some of the um, teaching staff of the burdens that come with that profession as well. 
So is that where some of your focus is going forward? What you've learned from the pandemic and moving forward is, is that some new programming or, or is there new programming that you're doing that kind of like stemmed from um, what you had to learn and pivot to during 2020? Yeah, it's you think about the pendulum swing and with 2020 and the pandemic, you had this huge swing to a lot being done online. Mm -hmm. uh, by necessity. And really in the last year, I think we've seen the pendulum swing back to a real desire to avoid online if you can. Face-to-face, in-person, um, online in special cases, kind of be where it was before COVID. I think we're going to see that moderate. We're going to see people realizing that, yeah, there, there are really good use cases for online learning. Um, it can provide a great supplemental role and there's opportunity to integrate it into the face and fa face to face environment in more of a hybrid role where maybe instead of sitting down with a textbook and everybody opening to page 47 and learning from page 47, everybody's sitting down with a laptop, opening up their learning environment and working to the point where they're able to and having a teacher almost coaching them through that content. So you can truly have students learning at their own pace, engaging in custom curriculum that's aligned to their interests, and truly getting more of that personalized learning experience that is just much more engaging and is going to allow students the time to master a concept before they move on, instead of just being forced to move on because of an arbitrary date on the calendar. So in essence, what you're saying is what you what Michigan Virtual provides is that that personalized attention that the teacher cannot give each student. It's almost like you can build this ecosystem and be like, all right, I'm going to guide you to this space as a teacher, but this is built for you. And then just follow the teacher is able to follow up instead of, you know, having to split her attention too much. I, yeah, I, 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 I shouldn't, I shouldn't say her you know, the, the right. attention of the teacher. So, yep. yeah. And I, I wouldn't say that's exactly where we are now, but that's where we see the opportunity to go. Um, we, we do allow a lot of vo what we call voice and choice for students in terms of helping to supplement catalogs and giving them the opportunity to work at their own pace. But going forward, we think there's a lot more role of technology within the physical classroom to personalize learning at scale. Um, and whether that's something that just Mich Michigan virtual alone can't do that, but we really hope to catalyze that across the state and beyond as well. Awesome. Well, I know that we talked about Michigan virtual and, um, how, how it was able to process all the things that went on and figure out, you know, how to move forward through the pandemic and such, but let's talk about you. What do you do to get away, get, a, get, get into the real world? Because I know that you spent the majority of your career <laughs> online. So right. what, yeah, what, yeah. what do that, you do get away from the, to get away from the screen? Right. Yeah. To recover from the PTSD <laughs> of revisiting COVID, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, well, I, I love getting out on the water. Sailing season uh, started for some folks last night. I wasn't able to get out on the water last night, but Lansing Sailing Club is a kind of hidden gem in our community. Spend a lot of time over there racing uh, laser sailboats, which is a one-person Olympic class dinghy, and then Lightnings, which is a three-person um, boat. We race those throughout the summer. Got a great kid program and learn to sail programs. Um, love being involved in those and teaching the sport to, to other people. It's kind of, I equate it to my form of therapy. When I'm out on the water, I have to pay attention to the wind, the water, the sail shape. And if I'm distracted, the boat's not gonna move. Um, so it's my form of, my uh, four month form of mindfulness where um, I have to clear my mind of all the outside world stuff that's going on if I really want to sail well, I've got to be focused on all of that and the strategy and the tactics and everything. So love being out on the water. I've got two boys. Uh, happy birthday, Cole. My eight-year-old turns nine years old today. Um, got an 11-year-old son as well, Owen. Uh, 
And I, I love living vicariously through them. Little League Baseball, Soccer, Cub Scouts, all of that fun stuff. Um, yeah, coaching coaching the, uh, the oldest baseball team, helping out with that. And um, yeah, so they keep me pretty busy too. <laughs> Yeah. So in other words, when you unplug, you really unplug. That's awesome. That's good to hear that. But thank yep. you. Thank you for being on on the program. Really appreciate hearing your story and learning quite a bit about Michigan Virtual and all that stuff. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. Hope everybody found it interesting. And uh, if anybody wants to follow up, reach out. I love to connect. I love to learn from other people. And if there's any way you think I can help you, um, I'm glad to be a resource too. In fact, how is what is the best way for people to connect with you? Yeah, uh, email is swatkins, first initial, last name, at michiganvirtual.org. Um, or pretty easy to find on LinkedIn or anywhere else, too. Awesome. And thank you all again for taking some time to listen to this program. And don't miss the next one coming out in a couple of weeks. And if there is someone you know of, that you would like to hear more about their journey, please email us at missioncontrol at introduce.com. And if this is your first time here, please subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform and give us a positive review. Thank you very much again, and we'll see you next time in the Control Center.